Hello everyone and welcome to the topic Lay Magistrates. The topic learning objectives for today are firstly to outline the qualifications of a lay magistrate. These were set out by the Lord Chancellor in terms of the qualities that they should have. Secondly, outline the selection and appointment of a lay magistrate. So the work of the local advisory committees in making their recommendations to the Lord Chancellor for appointment. Thirdly, to analyse the composition of the lay magistrate. What's the background of those people that are serving in terms of um, gender, in terms of ethnicity and so on? Fourthly, to outline the duties of a lay magistrate, the work they do, uh, the very important work they do in criminal cases as well as civil. To outline the training of a lay magistrate, so what scheme of training should they undertake to ensure that they're competent enough to do the job. To be able to explain the retirement and removal process for a lay magistrate, uh, how long can they serve for and, and what instances may they actually be removed by the, law, uh, by the Lord Chancellor. And lastly, to explain the advantages and disadvantages of the lay magistracy. So let's begin with the qualifications of a lay magistrate. Now one thing to bear in mind, if you can remember what I well, if you can remember all six of these, excellent. If however this might prove difficult, in the exam when the uh, command word in the question qualifications comes up, what you can say is the law chance that issued six key qualities which every potential lay magistrate should have such as and then I would pick two or three of these remember to get the combination correct uh, and then explain them so for instance good character what we mean there is the potential lay magistrate should not have any criminal convictions obviously minor offences like well deemed minor offences like speeding and so forth isn't going to prohibit the person from being able to apply but any serious criminal convictions would. Uh, also perhaps there are any civil orders out against the lay magistrate, potential lay magistrate, uh, by another person. So for instance uh, an injunction, uh, a non-molestation order, anything that highlights that their behaviour in the past has been a bit suspect. Understanding and communication is really vital as well because of course the lay magistrate isn't doing it by themselves. They are on a team, uh, a panel of three others usually, and so they have to discuss and communicate to one another what they believe uh, the decision should be, and also they need to understand uh, the proceedings and uh, obviously the consequences of what will happen should the, the person be sentenced and, and what the law says and how they should apply it, etc. Now do bear in mind that in terms of understanding, Lay magistrates, the key word being lay, they're not legally qualified. They don't have to be. These are ordinary citizens wanting to actually play a key role in their community. So they receive the training, and as we'll see a bit later, there's a court clerk who actually uh, is a qualified lawyer, and they are the ones that give the legal guidance. But in terms of understanding the law, there's also the sentencing guidelines that are laid out, which they have to follow almost like a checklist really so they're going through and seeing whether it applies social awareness is really important as well I mean of course one of the key advantages we'll see later of a lay magistrate is that they should possess local knowledge uh, for the fact that they live uh, near or around the the uh, local court and so for instance you want a lay magistrate who who understands the problems or, or concerns of, of their area. So for instance if there is um, a spate of car thefts uh, taking place in the lay magistrate's town then obviously that's something that they want to be aware of and then should any of those cases come before them they may well want to deal with them more harshly to send out a, a message of deterrence to any other offender that uh, might think about stealing a car. So in other words this is what you can expect if you do the same and really trying to put an end to that 
to that issue in, in their area. Also maturity and sound temperament. Again, obviously we're talking about the fact that uh, a lay magistrate, though the age is 18 to 65, as we'll come to in a second, um, very few lay magistrates tend to be at that early point in age that those are selected. Uh, obviously that's something that is trying to be addressed because we want a cross-section of of views and, and sort of ages on the panel but maturity is something where they have to understand how to treat witnesses in court um, how they should be conducting themselves uh, how they should be speaking uh, and so on and so forth so no sort of for example uh, slang being used or or any sort of informal way sound temperament this really means that we don't want someone that's a bit hot-headed or, or headstrong with a particular view uh, or is prone to getting very excited or, or eruptible. Uh, we want somebody that can objectively look at the case, look at the facts, apply the law in a fair and just manner. That really also ties in with sound judgment as well. So, again, we don't want any sort of prejudicial views uh, being apparent there. So, clearly, anything like sexism or, or racism, that's there's no room for that in the courtroom or in any part in forming your judgment. Commitment and reliability is also very important. Uh, again, at the bottom, we'll see that they have to sit for at least 26 half days. Be very careful, it's 26 half days. Uh, so, if that's something that they can't commit to, and obviously they won't become a, a lay magistrate, they won't be suitable. Now, even if someone uh, happens to be employed, has a job, the employer in law has, an, has a duty, if you will, a legal obligation to certainly not prevent you from being a, a lay magistrate uh, and has to understand where, where possible that that has to uh, fit around the, the job at hand. But again, we'll see later, um, most lay magistrates tend to be retired or part-time, perhaps because they, they feel more able to actually fulfil that role. So again, just the final bit at the bottom, age 18 to 65, live or work within or near to the local justice area. Uh, don't, don't, don't please put a local commission area, or, or whatever it is. Um, that actually, if you look in your textbook, that was uh, done away with in 2003. You know, the idea you have to be within 15 miles of your commission error. That's gone, so we just live or work within or near to the local justice area. And then lastly, as I've said, be committed to sit for at least 26 half days. So with qualifications done, we now move on to appointment, which again could be a question you're asked in the exam along with qualifications, or certainly by itself. So we have uh, a sort of straightforward process here. It begins with citizen uh, a citizen answering an advert in a newspaper, a magazine, really uh, what they're looking for is a diverse range of potential candidates. So they will tailor where they're placing these adverts in order to accomplish that. For example, it could be the uh, Asian Times, it could be Inside Soap magazine. Uh, again, perhaps they're wanting, for example, more sort of uh, women or, or housewives in that sense so that's really how they're achieving that demograph and then after that we have local advisory committees really taking on the responsibility of interviewing the potential candidates who've responded to the advert this is a two-stage interview process the first interview which has a panel of lay magistrates uh, some serving, some retired. This is really the expertise of the local advisory committee. And they will judge the candidate on whether they have the six key qualities, uh, which we referred to earlier. And, of course, if they don't have all of these six key qualities and it becomes evident that they don't have them or missing some, then that will be an end to that candidate potentially becoming a lay magistrate. Now, they're also going to assess attitudes. So if, for instance, the potential candidate uh, demonstrates any sexist or, or racist attitudes or any prejudice of any any kind that will preclude them from becoming a lay magistrate. Now the second interview, the actual 
panel of judges, uh, of lay magistrates, uh, are dealing with whether the candidate has judicial aptitude. In other words, they may have, as they've already noted, these key qualities, but can they um, apply understanding and reason as they would have to be or would have to do in the court? So they're given two sentencing case studies, and in this they're asked how they would sentence uh, those individuals, perhaps, and why. And again, later on in the interview they would come back to those and say, you know, have you changed your mind? Would you still agree that that was the right decision? And really, again, they're testing to see whether or not the candidate has decisiveness. If someone's indecisive, then clearly that is somebody that wouldn't be suitable. Now, once they have uh, drawn up a list of, or a short list of those who are suitable, having interviewed them, the local advisory committee sends the names to the Lord Chancellor for appointment until finally, well, the Lord Chancellor appoints candidates on behalf of the Queen. So one of the biggest mistakes I think that can be made in the exam is that students forget about the role of the local advisory committee. It is not, I repeat, not the Lord Chancellor who is doing the interviewing. Because if you think about it uh, logically and on common sense grounds, we have a number of um, local, sort of local courts around the country, and so therefore it would be impossible for the Lord Chancellor to be able to interview all those candidates. It's really a case of somebody um, acting on his or her behalf and then recommending the names to him or her, which makes the process far simpler. Now concerning the composition of the lay magistracy, in other words, uh, the social backgrounds of, of those individuals who are uh, sitting in the magistrate's court, there is this general perception that they tend to be middle class, middle aged and middle minded. Uh, and certainly a report, which is good evidence there we can use to enhance our answer in the exam, is the Judiciary in the Magistrates Courts report. And it did find, when it examined the issue further, that those serving on uh, as lay magistrates tended to be from professional and managerial backgrounds. Now perhaps we can conclude from that that those who've had careers who, um, for example, had their own businesses or maybe teachers or in some capacity such as that, uh, feel that they have the skills and the attributes that, that better serve them to be able to um, carry out that job. Again, there's a level of understanding, isn't there, required from the six key qualities. It is a responsibility doing this job. Perhaps those in managerial backgrounds, you know, they're used to the... Um, the authority of conducting their role and working with others in a meaningful way. So that certainly seems to make sense on, on that front. We also have, though, the fact that 40% of those serving tend to be retired from full-time employment. So clearly this is perhaps where the uh, middle-aged part comes in as well. Because those who are retired certainly, I'm sure, feel more able to offer their time uh, now that they don't have uh, a, a, you know, a job to concern themselves with, they perhaps want to do something different with their lives, having come from, as we've said, those sort of backgrounds. And so we're looking at people aged within the regions of sort of 65 upwards in terms of that. Now it's worth noting that the qualifications of a lay magistrate, as we've seen on appointment, is 18 to 65. But generally speaking, no one below the age of 27 tends to find themselves being selected. Now, a lot of work has been done to try and alter that, and so millions of pounds have been spent with, with um, various schemes, and it's slowly having um, some success. I mean, clearly having a cross-section of society in age and in backgrounds is, is a desired thing in terms of what they can bring and the views that they have to the job. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if you look online, you can see that... Um, a 19-year-old law student became Britain's youngest magistrate, Lucy Tate, to the bench in Pontefract, West Yorkshire. Um, she was, uh, at the time, in 2006, a, a law student um, reading for a law degree, and she decided that's something she wanted to do. So that is just one example of how people younger still are being selected. But she actually was open to a lot of criticism from her fellow lay magistrates who I think felt did she actually have the required life experience for the for the position. Happy to say she proved them wrong. And we also have the fact that generally speaking fifty one percent 
on average uh, are women who serve on the lay magistracy, which is great compared to professional judiciary, where that is much lower. We can see that a lot of work has been done there. I mean, I wonder still that if many are coming from professional managerial backgrounds, generally speaking, more men seem to come from managerial backgrounds. There is this issue of a glass ceiling for women. Um, now some attribute that to sexist attitudes, others attribute to the fact that women uh, have career breaks to start a family and, and so on. Um, obviously that can limit their, their progress, but for lay magistrates, because it is something that is a, a part-time responsibility that can be done alongside your job or if you're retired, however much time you feel you, you would like to do, at least the 26 half days, women seem to be more attracted to this potential position. Ethnic minorities are better represented compared to the professional judiciary, which again suggests why is it that ethnic minorities might be turned away from, from working uh, as a professional judge and taking that career path. Could it be the establishment? Could it be how that is promoted, viewed, stereotypes there? Perhaps certain communities aren't being reached fully yet, but it's still, in the lay magistracy at least, 8%, which is not great, but it's better compared to, um, as I said, the professional magistra uh, professional judges. Duties of the lay magistrates can be broken down in two ways. We've got criminal uh, responsibilities and jurisdiction, as well as civil. So, in terms of criminal, first of all, they try uh, around 97% of criminal cases. So, lay magistrates are really seen to be the sort of conveyor belt of justice. Um, Remember, the offences or the categories of criminal offence that lay magistrates deal with are all summary offences, so the least serious, such as uh, assault or speeding, for example, uh, up to certainly tribal either way offences uh, if the court uh, has accepts jurisdiction to be able to hear them in terms of has the power in sentencing to hear them and the defendant elects they want a trial in the magistrate's court. So again there, for example, assault occasioning actual bodily harm, tribal either way offence. So they deal with quite a lot, 97%. But don't forget as well that even the most serious criminal uh, offence, indictable offences such as murder, manslaughter, etc., they still have to do uh, have to start in the magistrate's court. So all criminal cases will start in the magistrate's court irrespective and they start there in terms of preliminary hearings so there will be a pre uh, preliminary hearing uh, an early administrative hearing which will deal with things such as whether or not the uh, defendant requires legal aid uh, does the state need to provide a legal counsel to them or can they afford it themselves uh, does bail uh, or should bail be granted remember of course if the police say no to that when they have a person in custody, then as soon as practicable, that person should go in front of a magistrate's court and have that issue dealt with there, uh, sort of like a safeguard as well. So all preliminary hearings for all criminal cases are dealt with there, but all summary and certainly some tribal either way offences are tried and concluded in that court. Now, they also deal with some civil matters, which we mustn't forget. So, quite clearly, enforcement of any debts owed to utilities, such as gas, electric and water, non-payment of council tax, and non-payment of television licences. Uh, it's easy to forget, for the exam, the sort of youth work as well that they're responsible for. Now, we're talking about here uh, the Magistrates Court also um, being set up as a youth court, to hear cases against offenders aged between 10 and 17. Um, if the, obviously, if the uh, offender is below the age of 10, they don't have, uh, they're not at the age of criminal responsibility, or, or doli incapax, as it's called, whereas if they're over the age of um, 17, then they are certainly dealt with as, as an adult in terms of uh, court situation. But between 10 and 17 there for age, we will have not just any sort of lay magistrates, they will be specially trained to hear these cases because they are dealing with young people uh, and obviously some sort of safeguards need to be taken to a place, the sort of language that they use needs to be quite sort of straightforward, simple, understandable, 
um, and obviously there may be instances as well where uh, they're needing to, to give evidence, uh, some witnesses by video link and so forth, so specially trained there. Uh, the panel of course will usually include at least one man and one woman and this is another sort of uh, provision where perhaps it would be all intimidating just to have uh, uh, three men uh, as lay magistrates, so really they're trying to have a, a sort of a balance there and making sure that the balanced views are taken into account for these sort of special cases. And finally, they, they also sit, lay magistrates, in the Crown Court to hear appeals that come from the, from the um, magistrates' court, so they resolve issues there too. Training of a lay magistrate is one of those areas in the exam, it's easy not to do well, so you've got to revise this very carefully. But the starting point to say is that it is supervised by the Judicial Studies Board. They establish the syllabus of topics and areas of focus that need to be uh, delivered. Um, now because uh, there are many magistrates' courts and sort of, if you will, local areas in, in, in the country, there's so many people to deal with. These are often carried out in the local areas themselves, sometimes in partnership with universities to, to hold as a venue, and they're carried out by the justice, uh, or the clerk of the court, or the justice's clerks. Uh, remember, of course, the clerk of the court in the magistrate's court is the qualified lawyer who assists the lay magistrates with any legal questions they might have, but doesn't interfere with their actual decision-making. So it's carried out by those clerks. Uh, there's broadly two schemes. I mean, obviously, even when you are appointed as a, a lay magistrate, your training doesn't end. You've got to, like any other job, keep on top of uh, developments and issues. And so we have the Magistrates National Training Initiative, or MNTI2, as it's referred to. Again, in the exam, do refer to it and it's by its full name to begin with. Okay, If you want to abbreviate it afterwards and and refer to it as MNTI2, that's fine, but do say it in full first. There are four key um, parts to this, if you will. So first of all, you've got managing yourself, and this is simply for magistrates to feel confident that they know how to deal with court documents and how they should conduct themselves in a magistrate's court, sort of behaviour and how they should speak, etc., You've got, secondly, working as a member of team. Now, of course, with lay magistrates, usually that's a bench of three, so it's very important that they understand how they're going to most efficiently reach um, an agreed verdict as to a case and, and so on and so forth. The third one, making judicial decisions, really speaks for itself, but does the lay magistrate understand, because there may be many summary and tribal either way offences that come to them, for instance, if it's a criminal case, do they know how they should be uh, going about reaching a decision, using the sentencing guidelines that are given to them, uh, what sort of things they can ask of the uh, clerk in the court, so that's something that is really, really useful. The fourth one, as you can see there, managing judicial decision making, this is for the chairperson only, so even though we have a, a three sitting on a bench, there will be one who actually takes the lead, who is the chair. And again, things to, to note for that is how the chairperson uh, should be managing the case, should be conducting and leading proceedings in court, and making sure that um, they are being impartial, that everyone is, is being heard, and, and so on and so forth. Now, there is a specific uh, training scheme for new magistrates, and this is, firstly, initial introductory training. So, remember, this is for someone who's just been successfully appointed a lay magistrate, having been interviewed by a local advisory committee. We saw that earlier. So, initial introductory training is really the beginnings where the person uh, needs to understand what the courtroom looks like, so we'll go and sort of visit. Uh, we'll also see that uh, you know they work as a team, they sit as a, a bench of three, where um, the roles and responsibilities of everyone are in the court. So that's the, the initial starting point. The core training, so the, the important bit there, is really that the lay magistrate is 
developing the key skills that they need in order to successfully uh, carry out this job. So, for example, are they um, what skills might they need? And again, you think of the six key characteristics as well, the six key qualities that were set out. But do they have the understanding? What do they need to understand? Do they know about the sentencing guidelines for criminal cases? Do they know and understand um, what the uh, clerk in the court uh, what can actually do? Uh, do they understand how to read a, a legal document? Uh, and so on and so forth there for core training. Um, really to make sure they reach a level of competency so that they're able to uh, sit and take part in a court case. And the third one, activities. Activities is really, once you've got the theory part out of the way as to this is what everyone does and this is my role and this is how I should do things, this is about actually observing um, magistrates in court and seeing how they conduct a case from, from beginning to end. Uh, and also I think visiting, for example, uh, it could be the local prison, uh, the probation uh, sort of office there and seeing the impact that their decisions are, are having on the people um, that they may be sentencing and, and also how those um, sort of parts of the criminal justice system for example actually work together so you know sentencing and you know how the people being rehabilitated in prison how does the probation office then work to allow these people to reintegrate into society. So this is really the key bit for, for new lay magistrates, those three parts. Don't forget as well, although I've been focusing on criminal, obviously their civil duties and responsibilities, as we saw earlier, such as enforcement of uh, unpaid, um, sorry, enforcement of television licences that haven't been paid, etc. This will also be covered in all of this as well. So still referring to training for new lay magistrates, after the core training and observing cases which we just set out previously, they will sit as a winger to hear cases. Now this simply means they sit either side of the uh, chairperson. So remember, usually there are three lay magistrates. The one in the middle is the chairperson who really leads proceedings, and the new lay magistrate will sit uh, either side of that chairperson as the case is being conducted in the magistrate's court. So during the first two years, between the eight and eleven sessions will be mentored, and this is important for new lay magistrate as it's essential really that they have somebody that they can turn to for guidance, who can uh, offer them uh, advice or suggestions in terms of their role and how to uh, conduct it. After the first two years, just like any other job really, an appraisal will take place where they really sort of look at the uh, level of competence that the new lay magistrate has reached, evidenced by the training they've undertaken, and, and really whether or not are they doing a good job. So if competent, they will be fully fledged lay magistrates and really can carry on from there. If not competent, they will receive extra training and Certainly, if this doesn't seem to have the desired effect, then there could come a point where the local advisory committee recommend to the Lord Chancellor that they be removed uh, from sitting and being a lay magistrate. Now, in terms of the training that could take place for new and old lay magistrates, uh, it could be, for instance, case management training. Uh, of course, you know, documentation needs to be dealt with, procedures change, law changes as well, and it could also be, for instance, human awareness training. I um, mean, there's a, certainly a diverse uh, range of uh, faiths that uh, ordinary citizens might have that come into contact with the courtroom and the lay magistrate. In fact, a person may not have any faith at all and be a, an atheist. So it would be certainly not the right thing for a lay magistrate uh, to ask the defendant or the witness, what's your Christian name, if indeed they're not a Christian. And certainly uh, any views that may be sexist or, or, or racist need to be challenged as well, uh, however slight they may be. So now on to retirement and removal. You Well, the retirement age is age 70, but you don't actually officially retire at that point. Your name is placed on a supplemental list and really you can continue in some capacity, but uh, in terms of sort of administrative functions that the court may have. Uh, you also may be 
removed from sitting if you indeed move from the area in which you live. So if, for instance, you live in one town and you move to the next, that will exclude you from sitting in that magistrate's court and you'd obviously have to go through the, the application process again. There are some special powers under Section 11 of the Courts Act 2003 which allow for the Lord Chancellor to remove uh, a lay magistrate on the basis of incapacity or misbehaviour. So, for instance, incapacity there could be that if the lay magistrate um, was involved in an accident that disabled them in some way and therefore meant the the job was really too much for them to, to continue with, or if perhaps due to age or otherwise, lay magistrate starts displaying uh, maybe it could be an illness, dementia for example, that would prevent them from uh, conducting their, their job as they normally might. So that is a reason that they could be removed. Although I think in most instances the lay magistrate would uh, probably well go of their own accord. You've also got misbehaviour. So misbehaviour could cover a range of, of things. Uh, usually, though, it's when a magistrate is convicted of a criminal offence. Uh, your textbook says there are about ten such removals each year, and on occasions there have been some removals for matters such as taking part in a, a CND march, an, an, an anti-nuclear uh, weapons march, or transvestite behaviour. Um, we have, as well, Persistent failure to meet standards of competence, we touched upon that a few minutes ago, but if somebody uh, is showing that they're not consistently uh, keeping to the um, six key qualities that a lay magistrate should have as set out by the Lord Chancellor, uh, it could be, for example, they're, they're persistently late for attending court or, or perhaps maybe they have a, a drink problem or something like that then that could be reason enough to remove them. And we also saw, didn't we, that if for a new lay magistrate, when the appraisal process comes after the first two years, if they're deemed not competent there, even after additional training has been given, then again, they can be removed. And obviously as well, declining or neglecting to take a proper part in their function as lay magistrate it really is a sort of catch-all kind of term. Anything that shows that they're perhaps full mind and, and uh, isn't at hand to the responsibility of, of being a lay magistrate and what that actually involves. And again, ne neglecting to take a proper part could well be that, again, somebody is persistently you know, late to court or certainly uh, isn't bringing with them all the, the, the documents that are needed or, or managing the case in the way that they ought. Now on to the advantages of lay magistrates. So first of all we have the fact, and, and this is certainly a, a, a main advantage, the cross-section of society. We referred to earlier the fact that these are ordinary uh, citizens who are applying, wanting to play a key role in their community. They see it as a sort of civic duty as, as well, perhaps, uh, although this one isn't compulsory like jury service. But there is a cross-section of society involved. So in terms of those lay magistrates, we have more women uh, representing the lay magistracy compared to the professional judiciary. I think we said around sort of 51% there. In terms, again, if we think back, we had ethnic minorities being better represented, about 8% there as well. So on the whole, it's giving a sort of broad range of views and, and life experience being offered to, to the courtroom. Uh, we also have cost. Uh, lay magistrates are not paid say for expenses. So this is something that is incredibly cheap compared to the alternative of using professional judges in their place, which of course we'd have to find. In fact, I think your textbook says that uh, it's estimated that it would be in the regions of £100 million a year uh, if they were actually going to replace them. So the cost would be you know, a huge amount. They are the conveyor belts of justice, really, on a cheap scale. Dealing with around, didn't we say, 97% of criminal cases as well as some civil. Few appeals. Uh, we'll see that some of these can be flipped around as disadvantages in a moment. But on the whole, I think they're seen as successful because when they try a case, the case really is concluded there and then. Um, they're in the regions of nearly 2 million appeal cases a year. In terms of appeals by defendants on either 
conviction or sentence, uh, you're talking uh, around about sort of 6,000 odd in that region for each of those. So when you think you've got nearly 2 million uh, cases being heard, then there's a very small fraction of appeals that actually uh, get anywhere, if you will. We've also got local knowledge. Another big key advantage here is well worth using the exam. As we referred to earlier, we're having, we've, we have this citizen who has this relationship with the area in which they're living in, or, or you know, or, or will be working to the court that's near to where they're living, and so therefore they should be aware of the the social concerns or crime patterns in that area. So again, if there happen to be uh, a spate of car thefts, for example, in a particular area, and that was of concern, and that was in the local newspapers, and you know, um, residents were talking about that and so forth. Any cases that come forward to the lay magistrates' court uh, should be should be dealt with because they're aware of it, and they no doubt want to deal with it, perhaps with a harsher sentence, so that they are sending out a message of deterrence. We are, you know we are showing that justice is seen to be done and we're serving our community. We've also got training. Uh, although it has improved greatly and it's certainly been more closely monitored since 1998 and the uh, Magistrates National Training Initiative 2 that came on board with all those topics by the Judicial Studies Board, uh, training can be variable like anything else. It can be done really well uh, by, uh, by some uh, clerks of the court. Uh, and at other times it could be done quite poorly. So I think it really depends on the quality of the training being given and, and who's delivering it, and it, it's variable. Obviously there are so many lay magistrates uh, and those courts across the country, that's probably uh, to be expected to some extent, but needs to be continue to be challenged. And we've also got legal advisor. In terms of uh, legal advisor, all newly appointed uh, Magistrates' clerks have to be legally qualified. Uh, they have to be, uh, I believe, a barrister or a solicitor for at least five years. And remember, of course, the court clerk is actually there to support the lay magistrates in their role in terms of procedure, um, assisting them with what the law is, uh, although the sentencing guidelines also have that there for them as well in a document. But they're not there to influence or play a part in the actual verdict, the decision making that the judges make. So I think you can say an advantage is they may not be legally qualified but they have the training and they have a legally qualified legal advisor at hand to help them. And finally we have disadvantages of lay magistrates, uh, one we referred to earlier, that they are generally seen to be middle-aged, middle-class and I think we said middle-minded, didn't we, as well? And that's probably a statement, though it's stereotypical, uh, because we can say that, as before, look at how many uh, how many more women and ethnic minorities are represented compared to the professional judiciary. But a disadvantage is given the fact that those who seem to seek out the position do come from those managerial professional backgrounds, tend to be retired from full-time work. So that's really where that perception comes from. So is it really a true cross-section of society and a range of views there? I think that can be uh, criticised. Also we have inconsistency in sentencing. So as I said, flipping, this is one to flip uh, in contrast with local knowledge, you would have a lay magistrate or magistrates that are aware of the uh, social concerns in the area, the patterns of crime, etc. But obviously those patterns of crime and social concerns can be different in each area. And for that reason, how they're dealt with, or how harshly they're dealt with, uh, as I said, they may want to be harsher on some crimes if, there is, uh, if they're more commonplace to send out this deterrent message. But it might be in another area that they don't have that problem. Their problem lies in another type of crime. So... In summary, I suppose you could say, if you were to steal a car in in one town, you might be given a harsh sentence, whereas if you steal a, a car in another town who hasn't experienced problems with, with car thefts, you might get something considerably less. Is this fair? It's certainly inconsistent. There's this view that the clerk in the court, um, although this person, as we know, is has to be legally qualified, have been a barrister or sister for at least five years, and is there 
not to involve themselves in, in the, the decision making or verdict in any way but to give guidance uh, as to the law and, and court procedure um, some do view the fact that the lay magistrates can be seen to rely on this person too much and of course again linking it in with inconsistency in sentencing if there are any uh, inconsistencies or, or, or little sort of perhaps errors made by a lay magistrate uh, the clerk of the court can't really intervene because it's not their place. We also have uh, the criticism that they tend to be prosecution biased so again it's almost flipping uh, another advantage in contrasting isn't it? Uh, we had the one about few appeals that was seen as a good thing but why is it that conviction rates if you will are so much higher uh, in the magistrates court some would say it's because they are case hardened so many cases they see day in day out summary offences uh, some tribal either way and really they become case hardened in that sense and also perhaps they're prosecution uh, minded or biased in favour of that because certainly if you're an ordinary citizen and you're dealing in a case where uh, the witness happened to be a police officer giving evidence, for instance, then we could say maybe they're more likely to want to side with the establishment and the police who they who they certainly trust uh, in that position. So that's something to be mindful of. And, and finally, training. We talked about this in the last, uh, the last slide, really. The advantage was that certainly there's been massive improvements there, um, topic of uh, a syllabus of topics being established by the judicial studies board but again depending who delivers it and, and so forth it can be variable in quality and so therefore that's something that's seen still to this day as a disadvantage well i hope you've enjoyed this video and please do uh, check out another video if you have the time thank you